Sam Witt is a poet from Framingham, Massachusetts. He's also a writer and a professor of English at Framingham State University. He felt he was nurtured in his love of literature. Uh, his childhood heroes were uh, people like Emily Dickinson and William Faulkner, Pablo Picasso, Nietzsche. And wanting to pursue matters of intellect in school, he did well academically and studied literature in earnest in high school. Um, noting that adolescence was a difficult time and he really dug into academics. And from there went on to the world of writing and worked as a journalist in San Francisco area, writing for Computer World, San Francisco Chronicle, and Wired for some of the magazines. And he then also got to writing his own poetry. And as he put his poems out in journals, published in a variety of journals, and then eventually into his first publication, he received fast attention. And his first book, Everlasting Quail, received the Catherine Nason First Book Prize in 2000. And then he received a Fulbright to go to St. Petersburg in Russia for a year and to read his poetry there. He was invited by the government to read at festivals. He was invited to be a resident at Breadloaf, and he's taught at uh, the University of Iowa, University of Missouri, Kansas, Whitman, and Harvard. And he's now at Framingham State, just down the street, and has written a second book. And the title is Sunflower Brother, which won the Cleveland State University Press Open Book Award and published in 2007. And he's a poetry editor for Jaded Ibis Press Collaborative, which is an ecologically sustainable press that produces experimental writing. And so when I asked Sam for a most memorable moment of sharing his poetry, he noted a few, reading in New York at the National Arts Club, uh, reading in St. Petersburg, also reading with students and talking about poetry with students in the schools. And, but he identified this one time reading in San Antonio, Texas. And he said, at this poetry reading, about six people showed up, and three of whom were friends of mine. Sound familiar? <laughs> Another person in the audience was on staff, was at the, book, at the bookstore, and was taking a break or something, he, he noted. And so it was a depressing experience at the time. But as he gave the reading, he said, afterwards, a very quiet woman in glasses approached me and told me she'd spent the weekend finding every poem of mine she could online, and that I was therefore her favorite poet as of the weekend. <laughs> That was an instructive moment, as I realized that poetry was a one-on-one -on -one engagement with a reader and not a consumeristic numbers game. And so I uh, very much look forward to what Sam Witt has to share in his poetry and invite you all to give him a warm welcome up here. This is called The Cold War, and I'm just going to read from my two books and then a couple new poems. Um, and I have a stack of my book, Sunflower Brother, in the back, if anyone's interested. Um, and these books can also be ordered on Amazon. Um, so this is the Cold War. A field of razor wire drifting through my sleep. A chip of potassium glowing faintly under my fingernail. I swear it was my own little war, the terrified world spinning like a coin. And I could never find the finger to touch your face by accident in a filling station. For instance, two boys catch a hummingbird out of the living air. They seal it in a jar without holes. Its flecked metallic wings tremble, flutter still. I watched it just now, spinning to a stop this dwarfed planet breaking down. I suppose I am an instant, a cooling tower of concealed clouds. We were that close. From a thousand miles away, you burn a valley of flammable air into my chest, and I breathe it when I sleep. In school, they taught us each atom was a solar system with a sun and thousands of planets. They were wrong. They were wrong about my finger, capable of touching your cheek. Uh, 
when I was in, I guess I was probably in high school or, no, it was probably junior high, there was a solar eclipse. And so, we, you know, I don't know if you guys remember, you make these little things in science class so you can look at the eclipse safely. And they tell you, uh, if you look at it directly, you'll go blind, those kinds of, of stories. Um, so I, when I wrote this poem, it was also during the mid 80s and there was still kind of a, a, a hint of fear over the Cold War and nuclear bombs and that kind of thing. So in this poem, I, I'm kind of colluding, uh, going out to look at the eclipse and then uh, a, a, uh, some kind of bombing emergency procedure. So this is called Eclipse. Then a hint of cold drifting through the window panes of the classroom. It's honey aching in the back of my head. In the light that had been floating through my eyes in a slant all afternoon. A cold hush spreading into the plaster specks, into fingers, stitches of chalk. The words on the blackboard suddenly grown strange. So they led us, class after class, children in furrows, down the long vaulted stairwell into the courtyard. I can still feel the light growing sharp, shedding itself. I can still taste a shadow of fire. That afternoon the sky flickered and the air went numb and shed us into our small bodies, cold, our teachers told us, this is the sun going out. Don't look up. It'll burn your eyes away. You could go blind. But we'd stared into it before. Those nights, mom and dad darkened together in the bedroom's eye, one on top of the other. We just couldn't stop. And then the doorway light blowing out, the leaves casting tiny crescent shadows of light on the pavement as the retina scar went trailing off. And if it is fire, cold fire we end in after all, a newly divided light we could only glimpse in that sharp angle of cold. Then, as in the dream, only the fire will sound. So deeply I feel it in my gut. And if the unborn children are there, Rowing off into the waters, a small scar will heal as it trails the boat into a blinded sun, into God's thumbprint, a scar I can't follow home. No breath, not so much as a flapping wing, only the sound of the creek swallowing itself. What I remember is the street lamps warming up, then fading to a full body immersion that left us cold. Black water, black fire, could we only enter you and cross back over cold, fatherless now, hunched like children, our traveling garments forgotten and reassumed like skin. So th this Next poem is entitled Petersburg Dawn, and it's, it's about uh, a battle in the Civil War, um, Battle of Petersburg, also known as the Battle of the Crater. I don't know if you guys ever saw a movie called Cold Mountain. Did anybody see that movie? Yeah, it's a good, it's good movie. Remember the scene at the beginning, that, that battle scene, um, when the Union troops blow up a big hole in the ground? Actually, yeah, and then they pour their troops into the hole and they get shot by a bunch of Confederate troops. So that, that's an actually, that's a factual uh, story from the Civil War. And um, so I reimagine this battle from the perspective of a Confederate kind of night guard just before the explosion, and it was a huge explosion. Um, so this is called Petersburg Dawn. I'm from Virginia, so, you know, that, that's where Petersburg is. Seconds before the explosion, crickets were chewing the thirsty air with their legs, thousands of them together. The air screamed. Silence. A spark 
could have touched the grass off. He was thinking of Mother's forehead, furrowing slightly as the bullet buried itself with a thud in the temple of Chestnut, his childhood horse. He must have believed the crickets would put even them to sleep, four gauzy cotton fields away, Against a leaning ash tree, half cocked over his gun, he fell asleep. Seconds before the tunneled earth flashed below him, seconds before the sun broke its chains, he was back in the barn again, hunched into the hammock, gathered into his own arms. Each crumbled tobacco moat was drifting suddenly alive in the swallow's smothered loft. A moth lit on his shoulder, exploded into his ear, and father jerked him up by the wrist. Think of family Bible leather, cracked, unkind. He woke alone, Isaac. Isaac, the sweating leaves burst into ash where they found his father's voice. Hardly had the tents become lanterns when the air was snatched of him. Feel your lungs expanding now, collapsing. Hear it with him, the first four notes of grandfather's watch chiming the quarter hour before they snapped, roared into an ocean in his torn ear. Just between us, the air kissed itself kissed his entire body in sudden daylight, a public gesture somehow made secret, a sheet of honey soaking his woolen pants, molding the coins in his pocket into a silver lump. Now that he's lifted by a monstrous falling from under this scorched wing, we can feel his incandescence, wet, heavy hay falling forever. At his body's assist, sorry, at his body's insistence, we must believe the rain evaporates as it broke, lifting the smell of burning horse. Lord, Lord, they are all free now. And this this uh, is called with crickets, and it's for my very close friend's sister. Um, who uh, w- was mentally ill. She had terrible depression, and she unfortunately killed herself. So this was the very first, probably the very first successful poem I wrote when I was, I don't know, 19 or 20. Um, and it's weird. This, this is my most recent book, but I actually wrote it before the first one. So that's, that's kind of how it works in the poetry world sometimes. <laughs> Anyway, so this is called With Crickets, and it's for Vicki Johnson, 1958 to 1988. It could have been on a night like this, with crickets and rain, when the swallows and the wrens have sounded their last wing flaps through the branches, have taken roost. I could feel the crickets like a fever on the air, Their last dumb song, maddening, alive. You are standing again in that spring of honeysuckle and oak in a garden, your stomach barely swollen. Of all this, though, what matters is here, two camel crickets after the rain has stopped, mating on my windowsill, one on top of the other, abdomens splotched and spangled as a lizard's back. I can't believe how still they are. One antenna, tentative and sweeping, how slowly they turn towards me, opening, pulsing now, stirring the dried shell of a yellow jacket. When one leg lifts and rubs across another, I'm holding my breath. Then, At last, the warbling call cracks, draws itself out, a single breath in my room. I put out the light, lie back. I slowly draw one leg across the other. 
When a human embryo is seven weeks old, the brain shines through its forehead, a cloud of light, belly deep and breathing, the whole luminous mass cabled and alone as the moon, torn off new, must have been, cooling in its black waters. When I heard what you did to yourself, the cyanide on the fruit roll up, the easy chair reclined, I could hardly see your face. I had never even touched you. A night like this one, with rain and crickets, your eyes cracked open, still. If I could build a boat with these words and float back, I'd drift on a shore tide, back over the depth of your last living room. I'd stretch my arm down into that still black and connect for a moment, my body filling with light, slowly, the way an oak draws water. I'm gonna... This is, this is a more recent poem that, that I wrote, um, and it was published in the Boston Review. Um, it's called Toxic Assets, and one of the things I'm really concerned about um, is, is the environment and ecological issues uh, especially what's sometimes called global warming. This is probably a bad name. It sounds like something that m might make for a nice day at the beach, but uh, I, I think catastrophic climate change is, is a better term. So one of the things I learned recently um, in the last few years is that uh, the West, something called the West Antarctic Ice Sheet is in grave danger of completely melting all at once. Um, and a team of astro, uh, sorry, geophysicists at the University of Toronto determined what that would mean in just in terms of the displacement of water. Um, and they determined that so much water could be displaced if that happens that it could shift the planet off its axis by about a half a kilometer, which doesn't sound like a lot, but the planet is quite large, as we know. So toxic assets is a, is a financial term, and I'm kind of connecting the two in this poem. Um, so, this is toxic assets. Oh, I, I should mention that these, the same team of scientists determined that if that happens, something like a third of our cities could wind up underwater, possibly. I mean, it's at least possible, which is really scary. So, imagine, I don't know, 15 Katrinas at once. Toxic assets. Vast forests have already been sacrificed in the marble halls of the bad bank for this. Now that portions of the glacial ice have calved to reveal stone that hasn't been exposed for thousands of years in the secret history of my left eye, which incidentally turns empty and black like the Xeroxed surface of a brook Coastal cities simply vanish into the sea. The planet's been knocked off its orbit by half a kilometer. In here, behind this tiny terraqueous globe under great pressure, I have stored away the tiny pearl of your face. If I were the death of ice, I'd calve. If I were deep waters, the birth of flesh would be whispered in overtones of fire. If I were Corpus Christi, I'd simply vanish into the sea. Uh-oh, running out of time. I'll just read a couple more. Um, this is called, if I can find it, Confession. Call it a meadow of combustible air, 50 feet from the parking lot. Love, if you could read my palm right now, you'd feel it. An oil can fire, a tramp, some burning tires. You'd feel the radiant half-life of our country at rest under my finger. A continent, really, collapsing as my hands part and it slips between the cracks 
something I can't touch, something to make my fingers cramp up and hate themselves when I reach out to you. The truth is, I love this world. Sometimes part of me even loves what we've done to it. A child burying lead soldiers after the war's over, for instance, not 15 feet away in this meadow is a good thing. I wonder if he sees me. I wonder if that crumpled piece of tinfoil spitting up jagged little eclairs of light between us wakes his eyes as they woke me just now. Oil on my hands. Call it what you will. A leaf, a stone, a nameless lake of space we drift upon. The truth, it's a lie. It doesn't move without you. The truth, we are alone. If you could read my palm, you'd know I'm something like a virgin right now, a field sown with gunpowder, something like the deer's skull my brother immersed in motor oil years ago in a cast iron tulip, a kind of perfect little ecosystem in suspension. I can feel it now, rooted in the back of my neck as the copper light anoints each cheek. There's a name for it when I reach out to you and find myself alone. Not helplessness or self-hatred exactly. If we could sleep together in that inner garden of breath, it would not be a human zoo, rather a place. I might have believed it isn't possible to drown in an abandoned meadow, 15 feet from my country, a lost child I could speak to. The very last poem is, is a very short one. It's called The Kiss. I kissed your wrist, your faintly burning page. I kissed the sun to sleep. What a little ocean I hold in my palm. Three stars and a sharp moon. What a little surf burying itself wave after wave. Into coils of concertina wire they freeze. I can feel it if I listen, if I close my eyes. I can feel it, this breeze lifting its shadow from the shadow of your hair. On this coastline of skin, anything can happen. Your lips divide my ribs one by one. The sun comes and goes with our name on its lips. My fingers in love with the instant it takes your breast to be there under my tongue. I wanted to believe I could fold it into my pocket, this vacant lot, this harvest of baby's breath and broken glass. Look, the sky is touching the sky. Oh, blue vein, Buried alive in the neck, my kiss. Thanks. I went over. I woke up inside the headache. The headache is a, is a room where I have to stay as I cannot afford to pay rent anywhere else. Every hair aches to the point of turning gray. There is an ache inside that Gordian knot, the brain, which wants to do so much in so many directions. The ache is also a half moon hanging down in the light blue sky. The color disappears from my face. My nose is pointed downward. The entire divining rod is turning down toward the subterranean current. I moved into a house built in the wrong place. There is a magnetic pole just under the bed, just under my pillow. And when the weather chops around, above the bed, I am charged. Time and again, I try to imagine that a celestial bone setter is pinching me through a miraculous grip on my cervical vertebrae, a grip that will put life, it will put life right once and for all. But the house of headache is not ready to be written off just yet. First, I have to live inside it for an hour, two hours, half a day. If at first I said it was a room, uh, if, if at first I said it was a room, change that to a house. But the question now is this, is it not an entire city? Traffic is unbearably slow. The breaking news is out. 
and somewhere a telephone is ringing. Thank you. These roles, souls, taking from sensory input. If it's obvious, then who am I? Who question? You'll find a god, innerving beyond the temple gate. Be like the squirrel girl. Fill up the coffers, yeah. Do what you do best. I'm beyond reach, I'm hovering. There are plenty of indicators, signs, instructions on how to get from point A to point B, yes, B, being, bean, brought, rot, fought, not, caught, taught. Scott, is it? Are you? Tish? Ahead of myself, yes. I apologize, I deeply do, truly for you. I think it knew. Stop the insanity, it seems too easy. Beyond the walls of so comfort there I see. Please tell again why you are a flickering. Perhaps, what is it? Farewell, fair, be, ah. Now, if there's anything you'd like to add, please forward to dad, you know, daddy, you know. Drink chocolate, variation classique, brought to me by my son just back from Germany. Rich and delicious, none can compete. Delightful to see, even better to eat. I ponder my son, how he knows me so well. His girlfriend does also, it's easy to tell. I think on these things as I finish some wine and feel so grateful for this son of mine. 